Before I get started on today's review, let's hear a few words from my sponsors. Okie dokie then, let's get started. The Range Ronin here, and welcome to my review of the Smith & Wesson Model 686 Revolver. And I am not horsing around. <coughs> There was a time when I was employed as a sheriff's deputy. When I was first hired, the department allowed deputies to carry anything we wanted, at our expense, short of a 44 Magnum. My choice of duty carry was the Colt Mark IV 80 Series Government Model 1911 in 45 ACP chambering. Carried Condition 1 in a secure holster, the Colt served me well through qualifications and street use. Heck, even a state court judge carried one under his robe every day while in and out of court. Some of the powers that be, however, took exception to my choice of firearm, although I had demonstrated that it was one of the safest firearms known to man, while dangerous enough to take care of company business when called upon. I was forced to decide on again at my expense, a different sidearm that could be a pistol, but had to be double action single action, because carrying in double action mode was supposedly safer than condition one carry of the 1911. While expecting me to purchase a Beretta 92 FS, because that was the most popular firearm of many LE agencies throughout the country at the time. The 92, however, was not my choice. Instead, I submitted and was approved to carry a Sig Sauer P220 and 45 ACP. It was soon stuffed into a security holster, again at my cost, and like the Colt, Sig Sauer P220 served me well during qualifications and street situations. Unfortunately, my partnership with the Sig Sauer P220 was short-lived. The department, to standardize things after new management took over, issued a new firearm. At least I didn't have to buy one, but I did have to buy a leather that met company standards. I half expected the department to issue the Beretta 92 FS. Nope, not even close. Instead, a new and shiny Smith & Wesson Model 686 was signed over to me. To me, it was a step backward, but... At least it could be stoked with six cartridges of 125 grain 357 Magnum ammunition, and I somewhat forgave management for hindering me with this revolver as a duty carry. The 686 had a heavy double action pole. The department armorer did an excellent polishing job on the action that, even though the action was still heavy, was smooth as glass. I learned where the staging point was with that revolver and practiced using that staging point until it almost became second nature. You see, we were not allowed to use single action during qualification or duty use, but somebody who could manipulate the staging point had a definite advantage over those who could not. My first qualification with the Smith & Wesson 686 resulted in scoring expert. That would not have happened had I not spent some time with it at my local gun club and range. The department decided that it needed a team of shooters that could represent the department against other departments in police bullseye competition. I found myself with four other officers that qualified high in qualification, and we soon found ourselves traveling to compete with other departments. Because of the need to practice a lot for competition, I decided to start hand-loading my own ammunition, 
which had to be 38 special 147 grain wad cutter. I was able to pull off several second place finishes with the Smith & Wesson 686 and a good recipe for ammunition. I wish that I could brag about taking top spot, but somehow it evaded me in the short time that I had left with the department. Unfortunately, I did leave the department of my own volition, Aww. but in doing so, I also had to relinquish the 686, as I was not allowed to purchase it. Oh, come on, man. It would be many, many years before I would shoot one again, and for some reason, I wanted another one. But the Ruger GP100 would come into my possession, Ooh. and I felt no need for another 357 Magnum revolver, with an exception with the Ruger SP101 that was carried on several occasions in an IWB holster. My local gun club and range, of which I am a member, had several Smith & Wesson 686 revolvers as range rentals. I rarely shot them. With a Smith & Wesson 686, I would be enticed into having one of my own, so I just shied away from it. The gun club put up several of their range rentals up for sale at an excellent price. One of those range rentals was one of the 4-inch Smith & Wesson 686 revolvers. I, uh, yep, the web was spun and I was soon to be ensnared. The revolver was dirty, very dirty, but otherwise it seemed in good condition, and there was no telling how many projectiles had left the barrel. The action was tight, and the timing seemed to be right on. The trigger pull was smooth, due to being shot. The sights were in good shape. Some minor scratches were present, but this was a range gun, and some scratches are expected. None were deep, and most would take to some polishing. Anyway, I managed to talk the range manager down a bit on price to an even figure. The 4473 was completed, money changed hands, and I was once again a proud owner of a Smith & Wesson Model 686. Arriving home with my new old revolver, I needed to start cleaning it up. Some carbon remover liquid, a chemically treated cloth, and a bronze brush soon made short work of removing who knows how much built up carbon from the cylinder face and forcing cone. The barrel, surprisingly, came clean after a few swipes of a boar snake treated with some ballastol. Some work with flits and a red polishing rouge on a polishing wheel started bringing out the beauty of that stainless steel of the 686. While not perfect, the old smitty was starting to look good. The beauty of stainless steel is that you can clean and polish without affecting bluing or other protective finishes. Stainless steel, like that found on the 686, loves polishing and buffing. So, let me quit horsing around and let's get into the Smith & Wesson Model 686. Before I get into the Smith & Wesson Model 686, first, let's take a look at the specifications. This Smith & Wesson Model 686 has a 4-inch barrel. Actually, 4.125 inches, as did my old duty revolver. The red insert of the front sight is slightly worn, but still adequate for sighting purposes. The rear sight is fully adjustable for windage and elevation, and the white outline is present. The grips are synthetic finger groove grips with a palm swell, and they feel very good in the hand. More on grips later. The styling of the Smith & Wesson Model 686 is what drew me to the revolver when it was first handed to me. The full underlug, the smoothing of lines, the blending of the barrel to the frame, all said to me that this was a quality firearm. You see, perhaps I was the only one that I knew that was not enamored by a revolver like the Colt Python. By comparison, in my opinion, the Colt Python was a pretty gun. The Smith & Wesson Model 686, on the other hand, was a working man's gun, 
and the Ruger GP100 even more so. I had read quite a bit about the Colt's weak lockwork, and that outweighed any good-looking ventilated ribbed handgun by Colt. The L-framed Smith & Wesson Model 686 would spit out full load 357 Magnum projectiles until you didn't want to shoot them anymore. The Colt Python? Not so much. With that said, however, the Colt Python would fetch the better sale price as compared to the 686. It's just a matter of flash over substance, and that is something that we are all guilty of selecting at times. It should be evident that the Smith & Wesson Model 686 is a full-size fighting, no horsing around handgun. The weight is 2 pounds, 12 ounces unloaded, and it is well suited for a duty security holster or excellent OWB holster mounted on a healthy gun belt. If you don't care for the stainless steel version, the Smith & Wesson Model 586 is the blued steel version. But, can you accept that the Smith & Wesson Model 686 could be concealed? Anything is possible depending on several factors. A vertical shoulder holster might be just right for the 4-inch and 6-inch barrel versions, like a Galco VHS, or a horizontal shoulder holster, like the Miami Classic 2, just might work with the 3-inch barrel version. A good IWB holster could house a revolver right behind the hip. I have been able to effectively conceal a Ruger 4.2 inch GP100 in an IWB holster with the proper combination of clothing and support gear, such as suspenders, but I can't say that I would like to do this every day. The Smith & Wesson Model 686 is also available in a 7-shot version, if you prefer that sort of thing. The downside is that there is less material between chambers, which is fine for shooting 38 Special, but not for firing hot 357 Magnum hunting loads. I'll stick with the 6-shot model, thank you. At this point, let me take you to the range with the Smith & Wesson model 686. I do prefer shooting any cartridge through a 357 Magnum chamber with 357 Magnum case dimensions, even if the ammunition is loaded to 38 Special or plus P velocities. I know that doesn't make sense to some, but I have some reasoning that is beyond the scope of this article. This Smith & Wesson model 686 really likes 125 grain jacketed hollow point, as much as it does standard 38 special, 158 grain semi wide cutter hollow point. It is more accurate than I am, but I could still qualify expert in a police force qualification and could probably still outshoot some semi-automatic operators with it, although I would have to improve my speed loading skills. From a combat distance of seven yards to 25 yards, you should have no problem keeping things within the nine ring if you do your part. The flash cap, the gap between the face of the cylinder and the forcing cone of the barrel, was measured at somewhere around 0.001 inch. But it is still wise that shooters keep their digits away from the front of the cylinder when firing the revolver. With full load 357 Magnum being fired, the muzzle flash can be quite intense. Felt recoil from a 125 grain jacket at a hollow point in 357 Magnum loading can be intimidating for someone not used to the cartridge, and to some that are. Felt recoil is very snappy and requires a full, strong grip to control it. Even with the provided rubber grips, the recoil comes straight back into the hand, and the open backstrap of the grip puts the stainless steel backstrap of the revolver straight into the palm of the hand. Using a high, thumb-over gripping technique can mitigate the felt recoil to a point while controlling muzzle flip. Depending on the ammunition and firearm, shooting the 357 Magnum can be an enlightening experience in that the cartridge produces an impressive fireball at the muzzle end, called muzzle blast, when the bullet leaves the end of the firearm and also at the forcing cone, or side blast. It should be obvious that when firing a revolver, the support hand should be well away from both muzzle and cylinder areas, 
regardless of caliber. At the range, the Smith & Wesson Model 686 ruled the day. There were no FTFs, FTEs, as found in semi-automatics. There was double strike capability, but none was needed. The Smith & Wesson Model 686 felt very good in the hand and is open for business. A break-in period is not required. While I like the provided rubber grip, and being true to my nature, it was only inevitable that a grip change would take place. A search wide and far was made, and I settled on a grip made by Hogue Grips. Their grips are excellent, and the cost is not too outrageous. I wanted a grip that would not only accent the looks of the 686, but would contribute to the control of the 686 during the firing of. The Smith & Wesson Model 686 that I have has the round butt configuration. I opted for the Hogue K or L round butt conversion. Goncalo Stripe Cap Checkered, SKU 19223. This is a round butt conversion grip that makes a round butt revolver feel like a square butt revolver. This grip was very similar to the grip that I had installed on my service revolver, except that grip was smooth-sided, and this grip has a cap that, while it extends the butt just a bit, also rounds the butt that eliminates that chopped-off look normally seen on square butt revolvers. Of the grips available, this grip was one of the few that was in stock, as many of the exotic hardwood grips are custom-made to order. The wood has an excellent pattern. I chose a diamond checkered pattern for finger purchase as this pattern helps to mitigate the handgun from rotating in the hand, which makes the handgun much more predictable and controllable. All edges are rounded to prevent the lowest possible profile, which aids in concealment. If the 686 was carried IWB or OWB under a garment or two, that is not to say that a Smith & Wesson with this grip is easy to conceal in the first place. However, with a good IWB holster, the Smith & Wesson 686 can be sealed, although summer IWB carry might be a bit of a challenge. The grip is also nicely sculpted around the rear of the trigger guard area and sweeps upward to the top of the frame at the back strap. The back strap of the revolver reveals itself at the top of the back strap, but like an iceberg, does not reveal all by hiding the majority of the frame inside the grip throughout the rest of its surface. The shape of the grip leads one to wonder if the frame is round or squared. This grip has my favorite finger grooves and feels full and wonderful in the hand. The texturing and shape are just right, although I would like a bit less material at the rear of the trigger guard. As with pistols, I want as much of my hand as high on the back strap as possible. With a build up of material at the rear of the trigger guard, my fingers feel a bit cramped when taking a high hold on the grip. Although it is ideal to have the trigger pull straight to the rear, it is more common that the finger pull the trigger at an angle that can pull the barrel of the revolver downward, if not compensated for. I find that with the grip's design, I have no issue with taking a high, two-hand, thumb-over grip on the revolver. The Smith & Wesson Model 686 has excellent smooth lines, and this grip accentuates those lines. Some grips have a tendency to take away from the overall look of a revolver, while some, as in the case of these grips, make the revolver and grip seem like a continuous seamless unit. You may notice from the pictures 
that there is no screw joining the grip. That is because it is not needed. The grip mounts with a yoke that is placed over top of the alignment picks on the lower end of the frame. This is similar to when mounting a grip on a Ruger GP100. A screw at the bottom of the grip holds the grip and revolver together. The grip, by the way, is a tight fit to the revolver. Some mild sanding on the top ears was necessary for the grip to slide all the way onto the frame. However, this was because the side plate of the revolver was not perfectly flush with the frame, and this added just a hair of thickness to the frame. Wood, being forgiving, almost perfectly molded to the frame. At this point, I do have to say that the grips that I purchased do nothing to help mitigate felt recoil, as do the stock rubber grips. The felt recoil of the 357 Magnum cartridge is sharp, and the frame of the revolver comes back hard in the hand. A proper grip with these revolvers does more to help control the flip of the muzzle and rotation of the revolver in the hand than just the handle of the revolver alone. I am more used to shooting pistols than I am revolvers lately, and the transition between the two sometimes takes some time to get used to. A good set of grips on both pistol and revolver helps me make the transition between the two as pleasant as possible. In parting ways with the grips, I do want to mention that Hogue has more kinds of grips for the Smith & Wesson K and N frame round butt revolvers, ranging from classic to custom in many woods and other materials than I can mention here. While I mentioned in the features segment, some of the holsters that I use for carrying the Smith & Wesson Model 686, I have since updated that list with what I think is the best shoulder holster that I have come across so far. A timeless rotor shoulder holster system from Felco that I purchased to house the Ruger GP100 also works wonderfully for the 686. The main feature of the holster is that when the retaining strap is unsnapped, the holster body swings outward on a pivot. Rather than lifting the revolver up and out of the holster, this pivoting of the holster allows for more of a near horizontal draw of the firearm. To aid in preventing the system from moving about the body too much are two hold down straps, one on the holster and one on the speed loader pouch. Each strap is adjustable and are secured with the same black heavy-duty fasteners as is used elsewhere. Each strap is leather and dyed in the same color as the shoulder harness. What I like about this system is that not only do the hold-down straps secure the holster and speed loader pouch, but they also keep my pants from lowering, as they would with a hip carry holster. This eliminates wearing my usual suspenders, as I would with hip carry or a horizontal shoulder holster system. The speed loader unit is horizontal, which aids in accessing the speed loaders and keeps the speed loaders from falling out of the pouches when not snapped. With that said, the speed loaders must be pulled from the pouch. With the Safari Land speed loader, pulling the knob doesn't seem to present a problem, since pulling the knob is used to lock the cartridges into the speed loader. I have placed a link in the description should you want more information about the Falco Timeless Rotor Shoulder Holster System. The Smith & Wesson Model 686 is just one of those must-have firearms. I fought the urge of owning another one quite successfully over the years, but the revolver was on my bucket list and I was able to own another one although used, but no matter. Chambered for a 357 Magnum and 38 Smith & Wesson Special Plus P, you have a wide variety of ammunition from which to choose. The Smith & Wesson Model 686 is just an all-around revolver that fires an all-around cartridge that has a reputation for taking care of business, whether it be personal defense, home defense, or hunting. And, for those who prefer shooting a 9mm, well, here you go. 
The bullet diameter of the 38357 is 9.1 millimeter, and you get to shoot a 125 grain projectile at approximately 1450 feet per second, with an energy figure around 583 foot-pounds, or a 158 grain projectile around 1240 feet per second, with an energy figure around 539 foot-pounds, among others. Pair this revolver up with a good lever action or bolt action pistol caliber long gun that can enhance the velocity of the 357 Magnum cartridge and you would not be undergunned. The perceived downside of a revolver is the lack of capacity as compared to high capacity semi-automatic firearms. But they may also have an upside. If you have to do with less, you will maximize your practice time to ensure that each bullet hits its mark rather than doing magazine dumps and not considering what you may hit when you miss your target. Aim small, miss small. One shot, one drop. Shot placement over shot volume. Learn how to effectively use speed loaders and speed strips. When I carry a revolver, I normally carry one of each, a speed loader on a belt pouch and a speed strip in a right hand pocket. Revolvers have been around since the late 16th century. But in 1836, Samuel Colt brought the revolver into more modern history. And in 1889, the first double action revolver was introduced. Revolvers are not going away anytime soon. Well, and as always, I appreciate you staying with me while I tell my stories. There are plenty more reviews of revolvers, pistols, rifles, shotguns, and gear on their way to you and I hope that you will support me in my endeavor to bring them. I hope to see you soon. And until then, stay safe out there.